हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग आई वेलकम दॉरन फैकल्टी प्रोफेसर मीवाको होसदा एंड ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट्स ऑफ दिस वन वीक ऑनलाइन ज्ञान प्रोग्राम ऑन सोशल कैपिटल एंड हेल्थ इन इंडिया हम प्रोफेसर मोहम्मद अक्रम होस्ट फैकल्टी एंड कोर्स कोऑर्डिनेटर फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सोशियोलॉजी अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी अलीगढ़ इंडिया वी स्टार्टेड दिस प्रोग्राम यस्टरडे एंड हैड फर्स्ट लेक्चर एंड सेकेंड लेक्चर बाई प्रोफेसर मिवाको होसदा देन वी हैड ए ट्यूटोरियल प्रोग्राम द ट्यूटोरियल प्रोग्राम वॉज वेरी वेरी इंगेजिंग participants had many questions and there were discussions professor miwako hosada engaged the first half of the tutorial and the second half was engaged by me and we encouraged the participants to raise various questions and try to answer those questions that was really wonderful and i got very good feedback from the participants about the discussion that we had now we are going to start the second day's lectures we are having two lectures scheduled today to be delivered by professor miwako <laughs> hosada uh professor miwako hosada you are already visible so uh just in one minute the topic of today's lecture is healthcare and human development experiences from japan now i would like to say that that japan is one of those countries which is having a wonderful performance in human development even in yesterday's lectures we had discussion on the human development perspective yesterday we were talking about the things in a theoretical way now today the participants sitting in india will get a fantastic first hand understanding of the kind of human development that japan has achieved and how important human development is for the survival of human beings all over the world right so i don't want to be a barrier between the participants and the foreign faculty i welcome professor miwako hosada and all participants uh i would like to request the participants to join the program if the participants are not joining all the lectures and the tutorials they will not get the certification right so we yeah. are as of now i can see that the number of participants is a little lesser but all participants are required to join the program so now over to professor miwako hosada for today's lectures professor miwako hosada i thank you for the introduction uh, professor uh, akram so uh, i just to start the second day of the lecture series So, um, Professor Agram said, "As Japan, uh, the the health care performance would be a bit kind of the one of the, uh, good, um, quality. However, we are facing a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, problems and the challenges. Of course, your country, the India, also facing the many challenges." So, just to discuss how we can overcome such a, a crisis and problems together. So now, so today, I just to talk about the healthcare and human development experience from Japan. So I explain about the current situation in Japan. So I'm very happy if you provide me the let me know the the current situation in India. So we can have a good discussion. So let me uh, share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, good. Yes, so, uh, so today, uh, the first uh, one hour. I'll talk about healthcare and human development. And uh, the second one now, I will talk about sociocultural determinant of health and health disparities. Yesterday, 
I briefly explain about the social determinants of health. But uh, today, I would like uh, to uh, talk about it more broadly, giving like, examples. So let me start the first one, health and human development. So human, so I will talk about human development index about uh, at the fourth day. So today I will explain the kind of the overview of the the kind of situation through the census and uh, the survey of the situation in Japan. And this is our story. Uh, so many data shows Japan grows old. As you, we can see, we, could, we saw uh, the, uh, the life expectancy in the international data yesterday. Uh, maybe you remember that the Japan has the longest life expectancy in the world. And also, uh, I have to say, the birth rate in Japan is very low. It's almost 1.3. How about in India? How many children the, uh, the people have in Japan? So 1.3 means the population is supposed to be decreasing because you know one household, their the husband and uh, wife, and they have the average of the children is one point three. So most people has only one child, and some has two. And if you have three children. People think, oh, you have a lot of children in Japan. And also uh, the Japan percentage of the population over 65 years old, it means elderly, is growing very faster. Uh, you can see the graph. Uh, so we are now 2023, but you can see the estimation of in 2050. Uh, currently, uh, there are um, almost the 30% of the population is elder in Japan. But so that means the one third, almost four, one fourth of the population is the elderly over 65 years old. But after uh, almost 30 years later, 30 years later, uh, the, almost the one third of uh, Japanese population are people who are over 65 years old. You can see the data of Germany and the US and China. Every country grows older, but the uh, Japan is the oldest. And So this is the uh, uh, population pyramid. The left hand is 1950. It's almost the right after the World War II. And the middle one is 2007. And the right one is the projection of 2050. So you can see 
the pyramid is just upside down in 2050. Almost 50, oh no, 70 years ago, um, the population pyramid is literally has a shape of pyramid. However, and, and also the, the people who are over 65 years old are only 5%. But currently, almost 30% uh, of the uh, population in Japan is over 65 years old. And 30 years later, almost 40% of the population are people who are over 65 years old. So as you see, many countries getting older and uh, it is remarkable that Singapore and um, Germany and France, but uh, Singapore and China grows older so rapidly. The European countries, it takes 100 years to be the elderly country. But in Asian countries, or it takes only 30 or 40 years to be old. As we see, it took almost 70 years for Japan to be old. So what happened? In European countries, they have almost 100 years to prepare to be the older country. However, in Asian countries, we only have you know, 70 to 30 years to prepare the older country. How about India? You have so many uh, populations and what is, you, you must be thinking about what is going on in 30 years or 40 years. Every country need to prepare for the future. And in that case, uh, I would like to know how the Indian policy and the Indian people are thinking about the future related with population. Uh, this is almost the same <laughs> graph, but uh, you can see how oh, well, oh, the allocation of the, uh, the life expectancy. The life expectancy at birth in Asia Pacific countries is very according to the data in 2014. But sooner or later, most of the countries will face aging. So it must be a big challenge for us. And not only developed countries and Asian countries, but also Latin America and Caribbean countries and even African countries are also moving to the Asian society. 
you can see on uh, this graph, every continent we are facing the aging society. Uh, this is a table of uh, life expectancy. Right now, the life expectancy in African countries is around 40s. You can see the bottom. Um, but the prediction show it will be changed, like many countries, including Japan. You can see the some African countries, their life expectancy is almost 50 or less. And in India, uh, we saw the data, the life expectancy is 68. It's almost the middle range of, to compare to other countries. And as I told, the birth rate is decreasing in Japan, but not only Japan, but many countries, the birth rate is decreasing. I don't know why this kind of the red line is appeared. <laughs> okay. Somebody, someone, oh, thank you for erasing it. Oh. Uh, Japan is 1.3. But look at, if you look, take a look at the Hong Kong, it's also decreasing. We have Hong Kong and Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, all, kind, all Asian countries. And not only Asian countries, but also European countries like Italy and Germany. Me, the birth rate is decreasing. But some of the countries like France and the United States, uh, the, the birth rate is slightly increased because they, before, they also um, face a fatality, low fatality rate. However, they changed the policy to protect the mother and father and children. So um, because of the, the, you know, the policy and the good social welfare for the child care, the birth rate going up. So now I will show you the Japanese medical insurance system. As I told you, a not medical system only can make the people, the, you know, uh, the wrong life expectancy. However, uh, the medical system is very important to protect the people's health. So I will show you uh, the Japan medical insurance system. So as I told you, every Japanese has to um, enroll the uh, medical insurance system. And every household has the medical insurance and uh, the people pay the premium to the, um, the insurance insurer. So the one in the middle, people pay premium and once people get sick and go to the hospital or clinic, they pay almost 30% of the total expense. 
And then the hospital uh, sends the bill to the insurer. And insurer pay for the rest of the cost. That means almost 70% of medical expense. And people's premium is not covered all expense. So the government subsidizes the rest of the medical cost. The budget is obviously came from uh, the taxation. In, it is kind of the, uh, the special case, but sometimes uh, the medical expect medical expense is very high and people cannot afford to pay. So uh, the, there are the limitation of the medical expense. So average income household, uh, they pay up to $50,000. If the medical expense is over $50,000 uh, 50, uh, US dollar, the insurer subsidized for that expense. Anyway, it, this is depend on the income level. And low income family, they don't have to pay for the medical uh, fee. And also, uh, the people over 75 years old, they only pay 10% uh, of medical insurance, medical uh, cost. So uh, this is the structure of the employee medical insurance scheme and the national health insurance scheme. So people who are working and the, that, pe that they are, they use the, uh, the employee medical insurance scheme. However, people who own their own shop or uh, own business, they are not employed. So they enroll the national health insurance scheme. So this is a difference. And previously, there were only medical insurance system in Japan. And not only medical care, but also long-term care was covered by medical insurance. However, it cost too much to continue operated. So to create sustainable healthcare system, Japanese government implemented long-term healthcare insurance to cover institutional care and home care for elderly in 2000. So you can see um, the There are of long term care insurance. As I told, uh, every people, every Japanese has a uh, medical insurance. And in addition, when people get 40 years old, the people has to pay for a uh, premium for long-term care insurance. So for me, for example, for me, I pay for uh, the medical insurance. Yeah, I buy, I pay for the premium for medical insurance. 
and long-term care insurance. So it is a lot of burden for the individual, but to um, cover to cover the you know the healthcare expense for people, yeah, it is obligation for the, the Japanese citizens. So long term care insurance is we pay the premium to the local municipality. And local municipality is to be insurer in this case. And if uh, we get older, over 65 years old, we can use this long-term care insurance for getting a uh, long-term care. And once we get old and use the service of long-term care insurance, uh, long-term care, so we pay 10% of total expense. And the local municipality pay to the service provider 90%. So there is three basic principles for the long-term care insurance. Support for independence or user-oriented system and social insurance. The first three, the system does not intend to simply provide personal care to the elderly who need long-term care, but emphasizes supporting the independence of them in the community. Secondly, service user can receive comprehensive health, medical and welfare service from diverse agents based on their own choice. That is important, people's own choice. Thirdly, those who are 40 years and over are compulsorily insured and thereby the relationship between benefits and the contribution are made clear and the stigma of welfare service is removed. So before uh, the social welfare service, the people who get uh, social welfare service, sometimes uh, they are stigmatized However, uh, to implement long-term care insurance system, the social welfare service is not the charity, but the right of the citizen. So it is a, a very big uh, change. And this is an example of long-term care service. So what kind of service are provided as a long-term care service? There are uh, two sides. One is institutional care and the other is in-home service. For example, institutional care, uh, some service at the nursing home or health service facilities or hospital for long-term care. In home services, there are many variety of services. The home help service or home visit nursing and home visit rehabilitation and even the home visit bathing. The Japanese people like bathing. <laughs> and next, uh, the community service. So daycare service and the day rehabilitation service. There are many such uh, community service facilities in the town. And also there are short stay services. And there are another many other many kind of service, service like a resident care facility for the elderly 
requiring care or rental service of assistive devices, such as wheelchair or special gate bed or special chair and, and so on. And also uh, home renovation is also provided through the long-term care service. And this kind of uh, the, both the medical insurance or long-term care insurance, uh, that is the system to provide the medical care and uh, long-term care. And in this case, um, the collaboration of the medical professionals and uh, social welfare service providers and the care providers and the family and the volunteers in the community are really important to respond to the lack of medical professionals. So idea to share the responsibility with many other related medical staffs, which is called team medical care, is introduced. So um, there the, this is the um, data that shows the diversity of elderly population. We call elderly the people, for the people who are aged 65 years. However, there are so variety of elders. The some are frail, but some are very active and healthy. So this is the data to show how uh, the elderly health conditions are. So it shows not every elderly are weak and bedridden, but certain amount of elderly population are healthy and active. But it also shows uh, the many of us cannot imagine how to live after the retirement. We can see the many, there are so many healthy um, elderly in Japan. The pink, you can see the pink car. Madam? Yes. When you're saying need care, which is in the purple uh, color in the, uh, the diagram, you are saying home-based care. When you're saying need care, which is in purple. Ah, yes. Actually, um, yeah, the, the, the purple one, they need care in home care, in home. Like a their their residential area, and the yellow one are hospitalized. So this is the difference. Right, man. Like you see, um, like a home visit service, like a home care service or home visit nursing, and home visit rehabilitation such uh, the purple um, line, they are uh, using this kind of uh, whole, yeah, this kind of a care service. Thank you for asking. If you have any question, please tell me. And this is the, uh, the data of the lifelong medical expenditure per person. 
sorry, <laughs> the, the misspelled expenditure per person is 300,000 US dollar in Japan. And half of them is spent by one over 75 years old. Yeah, you can imagine. So young, young generation, they don't have much medical services. However, if people get old, um, they need a lot of uh, medical services. So this is the data of the uh, 2010. And uh, the people over 75 years old, they spent, uh, yeah, of course, obviously, a lot of medical services. So this is the data in 2006, Japanese medical expense per person. So this is zero to 14. And the pink one is zero to 14. And uh, the gold one is 15 to 44. And the yellow one is 45 to 64 years old. And Green one is 65 years old over. And seven, uh, the, uh, the blue one is 70 years old and over. And the purple one is 75 years old. So you can imagine. So, and uh, the vertical line, it is not a US dollar, but uh, the Japanese yen. But uh, the unit is 1,000. So it is said that um, over 65 years old, it is almost um, uh, the, the cost of medical expenditure is almost uh, seven, uh, almost. I should calculate it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, almost a three three hundred thousand US dollar. Madam, yes. Uh, in that previous slide, you have shown that per person mm. lifetime. Expenses is three hundred thousand US dollars. Yes. So for one person for his entire lifetime, yes. an expenditure of three hundred thousand US dollars will be incurred. Yes. And in the next slide that you showed, where you are showing it, age wise split. So this is per person in one year or Expenditure per uh, person yes. <clears throat> per year it's is it expenditure per person per year, madam? Uh, no, no, to uh, per uh, in uh, 2006 slide. In 2006, you... yes, it is. Um, sorry, me calculating the US dollar. Um, so over 65 years old, uh, it's almost uh, seven, 70, 000, uh, no, no, 70, 000 US dollar. Uh, so year. this is lifetime. It is no, lifetime. No, no, per year, per year. Per year, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other question? So this one is per year. So almost um, 70,000 
Dara uh, used for the people in of over 65 years old. And this is a, uh, the graph of the Asia Pacific's aging society's healthcare spending. The rapidly aging population caused skyrocketing medical costs in every, almost every country. Many Asia Pacific countries, as you see, are facing this problem. In Japan, the healthcare spending per senior is about um, so six thousand US dollar in. 2015, but it is estimated the spending age up to 14,000 US dollar more double in 2030. So uh, the region's annual healthcare spending on people 65 and older is expected to reach 2.5 trillion Dara, US Dara by 2030s. And five hold increased from last year, according to the, the survey agency. So India, you can see, um, so the medical expense is not so high so far but it is estimated to grow in 10 years or 15 years. So this is a trend of medical expenditure. Um, so this, this graph shows the the percentage of the medical expense per uh, the total household income. So before uh, it is 50%, 15%, but currently 45%. So the medical expenditure in Japan became two. 0.7 times more to compare to 20 years ago. Of course, many developed countries such as the US, Canada, Australia, and the European countries share the same problem. The total health expenditure per capita is increasing Rapidly. And for Japanese, there are many um, issues for related to the aging. However, uh, I can say two main issues caused by aging. The first one is lack of healthcare service. It is obviously the shortage of healthcare professionals and it is there are high healthcare expenditures. So strengthening of healthcare system is needed. And the second one, I would like to insist that not much consideration of life after retirement. So in Japan, most of the, con uh, the company and government and municipality, they are the retirement age. It is, it depends on the country and uh, the company, but it's almost the 60 or 63 and somewhere 65. How about in India? <laughs> so yeah, people, you know, quit their job at almost the 60 or plus. 
years old. But after retirement, they have they are facing the challenge because after they, many of the people doesn't think about what do they do after retirement. So change the way of thinking and value and social norm is needed. So to respond to these two challenges, it seems that they are the sort of movement are proposed in Japan. Madam, may I yes. ask one more question? Yes, uh, sure. In, in India, the retirement age is usually 60 or 65 years. Mm -hmm, yes. What is the retirement age in Japan? Ah, same. I told 60 or 65 or 63. It depends on the, con yeah, the company. Right, ma'am. So let's see the first one, the shortage of the healthcare service. So in Japan, we have the social insurance uh, coverage and the, it is called almost the universal healthcare coverage. And the access of for the healthcare and the cost and the quality, um, sometimes uh, it is said affordable. But once the number of the patient is grow, you know, as I told, uh, the old the the population of elderly is growing and they need a lot of medical services. So the shortage of healthcare provider like healthcare professionals will be problematic. In Japan, the physician's density is relatively low to compare to other country like uh, Sweden or Italy or other European countries. So it causes a limitation to access the healthcare. So this is the practicing physician density for 1,000 population. How about in India? <laughs> How many uh, doctors for 1,000 population? So this is the number of physician per 1,000. So it is the same graph. So, and this is the number of nurses per 1,000. You can see uh, the, Japan, the number of Japan, number of nurses in Japan, it, it seems average. However, if we see another day per bed, the hospital bed, because there are many you know, hospital bed and hospitalized people in Japan, the allocation of nurses is quite low. It's almost the lowest. There are not a country, Turkey or Korea. However, uh, there are only two, almost two nurses per 1,000 bed. It, uh, no, 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 a uh, per bed, per one bed. It is really low. If we see the Denmark or Norway, there are almost four nurses per bed. 
So let's think about the second challenge. Is written by Linda Gratton and Andrew Scott. In Japan, this book of an Japanese So the book entitled The 100 Years Life was published and it attract and give influence to many people in Japan, especially policy maker and the government officer in, and even the prime minister like this book. And according to the research of Yoshi Berkeley and the JAMA Institute, uh, this book says 50% baby born in 2007 are predicted to be alive over 100 years in developing countries such as Japan, US, Italy, and France. So in this book uh, proposed, uh, we need to think about the 100 years life. That means uh, even the, the retirement age, they are 60, we need to consider after retirement. So we can see the review from amazon.com, a wake up call that describes what to expect and consider the choice and option that you will pay. So before, um, Many people doesn't think about the after how, what do they do after retirement. However, um, we are facing the old elder uh, age, and we need to consider about the about after retirement. And the key. This is the key concept for living a 100 year life. And the discussion has been evoked to de design the life after retirement. And you can see the three factors of So first one is start as early as possible to prepare for 100 year life. And second one is create a step-by-step -step plan. And third one is consider effectiveness and contribution. This concept uh, proposed by the, uh, the Japanese um, Institute of Health Policy and uh, Social Policy. What do you think? To live a healthy and well being life after retirement, you know, there are many things to do. Then the new community model and life design, which is associated to the 100 years life. The essential concept of this is change mindset and challenge, change way of learning and change way of working and encourage social participation. This is the model of community-based integrated care in Japan. Before, uh, 
for the elderly care, institutional care in the nursing home or hospital are common. However, as we see uh, the aging society, there are not so many capacity to accept the elderly in the institution and like a nursing home or at the hospital. So uh, the government uh, encourage the elderly to live in the community. So they propose the model of community-based integrated care. This is which make community network to realize supporting formation by combining of elderly's housing and healthcare and long-term care facility. In this scheme, Senior Citizens Club and the Resident Association, like a volunteer, voluntary sector, are significantly important. So, this kind of the community based integrated care, the diverse of people's participation is expected. It is, it seems like a you know, new community model and uh, to set the elderly in the middle. So the community building is very important issues for us to make a sustainable uh, health society. So I would like to show one example to build a community through the university. The, my university is a university. So we have the campus in um, Hakone area. It is very um, kind of the local, local city. And there we open one room for community people. And the people in the community visit the university uh, to create their, you know, uh, the, or to create their uh, uh, friendship and network. So this is one of the, such a group of women. Uh, the average of this ladies group is the age, the average age is seventy five years old, and oldest one is ninety years old, and they get together the once a week and make some activities at the university. Actually, they create the handmade accessory or handmade um, ornament like this. And they display it at the university and the um, faculty and student enjoy looking at the, their works, artworks, and also they create the communication together. So this kind of community make the, the basic of the community in integrated community care. So um, according to the, the research about the health and the community, it is really, it is, it shows the, the good community make the healthy people like uh, 
the community reduce health inequalities or community engage the people in need and also the community make empowerment for the people and create uh, the resilient relationship. So, a new community model and life design, inclusion and uh, multi generation and co creation are important. And let's see uh, what is the inclusive society. So this is the one which I told yesterday at the last lecture. Uh, inclusive society is one of the, uh, the goal and one of the ideal type we are heading. This is a symbiotic society and it is a process that strive to ensure that regardless of their background, have equal opportunity and can achieve their full in life. And it is a pluralistic process that creates conditions that enable all people in society to participate fully and actively in all aspects of life. Seven economic and political activities, as well as in the process that reach to decision. So these kind of uh, things, enriching human being. So health and development from the protection to 20 years of age human capital so you can see this uh, from the lancet so health is related many way from birth to the death so i would like to stop it here and if we have a and uh, more time, I would like to say how the community building is important in the devastated um, era. So, for example, we had a great East Japan disaster in 2011, and uh, because we have the you know, triple disaster like earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear power plant accident. Because of that, many community were destroyed. People has to move to the different place to escape the disaster. And the traditional community are all separated and they need to restore the community. It is really hard work, but people try to make their own community after this disaster. So if I had a chance, I would like to talk about it, but today it's time, the time is over. So I stop here, but anyway, so um, community building is very important to create a sustainable, healthy society. So we will have a 10 minutes break for now. Is it okay? So yes, 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 now. yes, 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 Professor Niwakko, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful lecture. And we all have learned a lot about the human development scenario in Japan. And that was one of the most important uh, core area of this course that we need to understand that why Japan is providing such a wonderful discourse on human development. So we got a first-hand account from you. Thank you very much. Uh, you can take two minutes break because as you know, 
you have your second lecture scheduled uh, side by side. So uh, if you wish to take a two minutes break, you can take, I can engage the participant for next two minutes. Otherwise we have the second lecture scheduled and the title of the second lecture is Sociocultural Determinants of Health and Health Disparities, Understanding Public Health Outcomes, right? Okay. So can I go from uh, the uh, two minutes break or 10 minutes break? How uh, long? How long the break time is? Uh, basically, you can go for a five minutes break. Five is minutes. Okay. Yeah. Please. <laughs> See please. you in half, in five minutes. Yeah. Please. Please. So I have uh, one or two things to announce here. I'm I can I'm privileged to uh, make use of these five minutes. Uh, Professor Miwako has delivered a wonderful lecture on human development in Japan. In the tutorial part, I will come back to the concepts of human development. Why do we need to talk about human development? I'll also discuss a, a little about the Indian context and scenario and human development basically. And I'll try to understand the, I'll try to make you understand the where actually human development is situated in the overall paradigm of development. Because, you know, uh, students who are not coming from sociology or social science background, or maybe not economics background, some of them may not be aware of the different paradigms on development. We do talk about economic development. We do talk about social development. We talk about human development, and we talk about sustainable development. So there are four prominent paradigms on development. We need to see the, the kind of continuity which is existing among all these paradigms of development and why human development is considered one of the top priority for the development goal world over. Then I would like to also relate these concepts of human development with two very important goals that we all are familiar with. One is the Millennium Development Goal. And the second one is the sustainable development goal, right? So the millennium development goal was basically a launch at the turn of the millennium 2000, which had eight goals, well-defined goals. And then in 2015, at global level, we initiated the sustainable development goals. Again, what kind of activity is existing between the millennium development goal and sustainable development goal? These things will take up during the tutorial classes. And I'm sure that many of the participants do have some kind of familiarity with these development paradigms. So when required, they can present their own views. As we discussed yesterday also, during the tutorial classes, the participants are required to make some small observation then raise their comments and their questions, queries, doubts, everything, very participatory model of learning this is. Uh, and then I have one small announcement also for the participants. After the completion of the second lecture at 12 noon, we have a short inauguration program here in Faculty of Social Sciences, Department of Sociology. This is an online program and this will also remain online. However, some of the guests who are here in the institution, they will come and join and they will address to the participants so that the participants who are coming from different parts of the country get some kind of exposure about this institution also. So this will be a very short time and that will be basically conducted during the break. We need to have a technical break. Initially, we planned a 15 minutes break, but because of the requirements, the technical requirements related to the GAN program, we need to provide them the recorded videos. So you may be familiar with the thing that, that when we are having a live program and when we want to store the data, then the laptop basically needs 30 minutes or 40 minutes to store the data, right? That is why yesterday also we had to create a gap between the lectures and the tutorials because the data is storing needs some time. So today, when we will go for the data storing, the one laptop will have this program in between, right? It is going to be a short program. So uh, I request the participants to remain connected. After the 
inaugural program, we will start the tutorial program, right? So this is the schedule for today. Uh, I hope that Professor Miwako would be ready by now. Uh, and whenever she is uh, uh, ready for the second lecture, she will join. We will continue till 12 noon, and then we will have a short gap for the inaugural program. But the, basically, this, this uh, link will continue to work. This link will continue to work. And now, I have Professor Miwako Hosoda from Sasa University, Japan is back. So over to you, Professor Miwako Hosoda. The fourth lecture scheduled today. This will continue up to 12 noon Indian time. I don't know what would be the Japanese time. Uh, must be an evening hour for you, ma'am, right? So uh, the, the topic is sociocultural determinants of health and health disparities, understanding public health outcomes. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Graham. <laughs> Actually, it is uh, 2.43 in the afternoon in Japan. <laughs> So it's so almost three and a half hour different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, we also uh, took an uh, overview of social determinant health, uh, viewing the rainbow model of the brain and the white head. So we take a look again and to understand more. So, um, this is the rainbow model as you saw before. And the red center is what we are basically born with, such as gender, age, and heredity. So this core, this part, we cannot change easily, or we cannot change at all. However, uh, the orange part and the yellow part, green part, purple part, someone we can change by our own effort. And some part we cannot change by our individual effort, but if we do the collective effort, we can change to make healthier society. So let's take a look uh, from outside. So the orange part, lifestyle, what is this? And uh, this is the eating habit or exercise or, or you know, the, the tobacco control or something like that. If um, people do the healthy lifestyle, like uh, eating healthy food or thinking about uh, nutrition balance, it is something to protect your own health. So how about yellow one? This is the relationship between others like family or community member or friends. The good human relation makes you um, make you um, healthy. We saw about the importance of community and and the community uh, is very effective to avoid the loneliness and isolation of the individual. So uh, yellow part, the relationship with others are very important to protect health. And green one, this is educational level and employment status 
and housing condition and medical sanitation. So education level is also related with the health. Have you ever heard of health literacy? Literacy is usually uh, considered about the, your, the ability to read or write or speak the language. And health literacy is something to understand the, relate, the something to relate it to health. It, when you will go to the hospital or what type of uh, the drug you take or what kind of lifestyle to know the what kind of the lifestyle is good for your health. All these are uh, considered a, a health literacy. So liter this kind of health literacy is so related with educational level. And employment status is also important. If you don't have the job, like uh, uh, unemployment status, the your health gets worse. This, these are also the data shows um, that people who doesn't have work uh, not less healthier than the people who has work. The housing condition is also related with the health. The enough, there are the enough space for family members in the house. It is also important. And and uh, it is also related that the house is located in the safety area. If the house is located in the dangerous area, your life is threatened. And medical sanitation, it is easy to imagine. Like uh, there are the clean, water and uh, the good uh, health, clean environment, it is really important to protect your health. And let's see the purple one, the society, economy, culture, natural environment, international affairs. So society like uh, um, the monopoly or the um, something uh, not a democratic society and people that not have a right to speak out in such case, um, people's health are not, is not protected. So in different words, good governance is important to protect health. And the economic situation is also related to health. The, to cover the medical expenditure, and uh, people, the, usually the government subsidize the medical expense to get the, to use that budget from the government that uh, good economic status is crucial. And the culture as well, like uh, the gender equality and uh, the, to respect the people with disease or disability in such in such uh, items, which is related to cultural perspective, are also related 
with hell. The natural environment as well, uh, the, like a uh, earthquake or the flood and hurricane and tsunami. This kind of uh, the natural environment is also related with the health and life. The international affair is also related with health, like an invasion of the war or terrorism or coup d'etat. This kind of, um, you know, the violation is affect people's health and lives. So all things and all social um, phenomena are affected with the health. So it is called social determinant health. So maybe you will find your own health status by thinking about the social aspect. Yeah, please do it by yourself. So data shows the social status is if social status affect the health. This is the life expectancy at age 25 for US citizen. A black and white men with similar income level. You can see the income level from $10,000 or less to $25,000 or more. And the vertical line shows the life expectancy at age 25. So, and the orange one is white man and the dark blue one is black male. And what do you see? And white male and the relatively high income live longer than the other. It is almost uh, 78 years old. And you can see also, also the each income level, the white man live longer than black man. And the lesser the social uh, the income level, the shorter they are in life expectancy. So that means social income and race and ethnicity is related with the life expectancy and health. And this shows the obesity, relationship obesity and income and educational level. Obesity is obviously has a health, has evoked the, uh, the health condition. Obesity causes the heart attack and sometimes the stroke. So the obesity it's not the individual's preference or individual responsibility. If I see this um, graph, we can understand the obesity is caused by the social income and educational level. This shows the higher the education history, the more are the lesser the obesity occur. And also the higher the, social, the income 
rather the lesser the obesity occurred. And this is the graph of the people of LGBT and LGBT people has limited access to healthcare. It is also, uh, it also shows the social discrimination is related with health condition. So even the, this is the data from United States, even you know, people, we sometimes consider uh, the United States has a very tolerant and uh, the equality of the people with equality and human rights of uh, the LGBT are ensured. However, the data shows um, the LGBT have limited access of, to healthcare. So you can see the graph. For example, the heterosexual are more likely to have health insurance coverage to compare to the LGBT. And this is the health disparity number one. And the second one is adult LGBTs often delay or do not seek medical attention because they fear, they have fear of being discriminated discriminated against by medical professionals. And the number three, the adult LGBT are often delayed in getting prescription or are not allowed to have them issued. And the number four, the adult LGBTs often go to the emergency room because um, they don't want to go to the medical office to because they are afraid to be stigmatized. So they don't go to they go to the emergency room because um, the health condition is very severe and critical. So, and uh, we see the social determinant of health, the health outcome is so related with social condition. It's not a heredity or a gene. For example, Japan, as we see, um, the life expectancy is over 80. For women, uh, it is 87 years old. So, however, before the Japanese life expectancy is very low. You can see uh, this graph, sorry, it's almost Japanese. But however, you can see the, the number. <laughs> Uh, the beginning of 20th century, like uh, 1926 or 1921, the life expectancy of Japanese is only 42 or 43. And after the World War II, the life expectancy of Japanese is almost 50. And then the life expectancy is dramatically changed. What do you see, think? <laughs> what makes this change? Of course, the invention of the new medical drugs like uh, anti um, antibiotic or uh, some other uh, medical technique like uh, operation and 
there are some the invention of the medical device like a CT scan or MRI. There are many reasons that they are surgeon, that they are the social aspect. So this is the graph of the relationship between the infectious disease and the water supply systems in Japan. So uh, before the water supply system is not covered many places, but uh, from the middle of 1980, the water supply system uh, is covered for almost all Japan and the sewage system is also developed. And in the other hand, the case of oral infection by waterborne disease like a cholera or dysentery or typhoid or protopoid are decreased and now almost zero. So um, medical development is very important, but the social system like uh, hygiene and water supply and employment or uh, the, the security of the, the labors, all kind of social aspect as affect the life expectancy of Japanese. So now so we are facing uh, the global pandemic of infectious disease. So I will take a look at the infectious disease related with some the COVID-19. Sometimes infectious disease is considered about a medical matter. However, it is so re related with the social aspect. The infectious disease uh, caused by the pathogen such as virus and bacteria. However, uh, many social uh, in impact uh, caused the crisis of pandemic. So the human history can also be as a struggle against infectious disease. Since the time of ancient Greek and Romans, human has been affected by infectious disease, like uh, Prague and the, it was occurred in 14 years, 14th century, killing more than 20% of the world population. So this figure, you can see uh, the Prague physician in 17th century in Italy. At that time, the Prague was believed to be spread by marginal air. So the doctor is wearing a gown covering his entire body and a mask and covering and to protect himself from the air. The top of the mask, you can see like a beak. Uh, it is um, some, so in this beak, um, there was something uh, stuffed, the large amount of the spice to protect the, this physician. 
the stick, you can see the stick, stick-like object in his hand. This is a tool for pillow bottom molding. The treatment at this time was the pillow bottomy in which a leak was placed against the swollen limbs node caused by the plug to stock the blood. It is obvious to us today that this is ineffective, but for a long time, people had, had nothing to do with the infectious disease. But remember, before the invention of the vaccination, we also um, did the same thing to protect, protect from the COVID-19. So we are still wearing a mask and covered the PPE. Um, so human practice is not so changed since 19th century. However, we have some the new technology and knowledge that is modern epidemiology and modern immunology. So epidemiology is the study of the frequency and distribution of health-related events in a community or specific human population rather than an individual to determine the factors that contribute to such event. And immunology, this is a study that aims to elucidate the immune function of living organisms. Immunity is a defense system that resists and defeats the invasion of pathogen, toxin, and other foreign substances into our body. So you can see the, the picture of John Snow. He is said the father of epidemiology. Now, John Snow believed that cholera is transmitted by bacteria. And in 19, middle of 19th century, uh, the, the cholera pandemic in London And John Snow uh, focused on cluster where people live cholera clustered. You can see the black dot on the map. This is the, uh, the people's house who get cholera. And this black cluster are where the outbreaks were. And there was a pump that pump went from the well. People drink the water from that pump. So this is located in almost the middle of the black cluster. And John Snow told the residents not to drink the water from this pump. And then the cholera was eliminated. So that means uh, the John Snow did not um, know the cause of the cholera. However, he found that, uh, sorry, he found that um, the, the poem, the, the intake of the water from the pump make people cholera. So this is a typical um, case of epidemiology.
So let me move to the vaccination and immunology. So Edward Jenner discovered that people who had cowpox were no longer susceptible to smallpox. And the French man, Louis Pasteur, discovered that immunity could be created by crafting a pathogen. Weaken its poison and in upgrading people with it. Then the immunization is the most important way to immunize and protect people from infectious disease. At the world implies a seed is planted in the body in advance. This seed is the vaccine. And uh, the, it is a state which the body becomes accustomed to a disease after contracting it lightly. So if you have immunization, you feel bad and tired. That means your body gets very lightly um, the, yeah, affected by that the vaccine. Yeah, at the time, the body produces the antibody or resistance to the disease, making it less likely to contract the disease period after. So there are many vaccine preventable disease. Many, but not all. Like uh, previous COVID-19, we, we didn't have uh, vaccine. However, now we have. So do you know what vaccination have you received so far? Do you have some record of the vaccination? So maybe um, your parents know that. <laughs> it is really important to be to know uh, what vaccine you have. It is so related with health literacy. So maybe you know the, um, the mechanism of vaccination. So this is um, the mechanism of vaccination. Of course, um, the vaccine comes with risks. However, even if they accept the risk, they are vaccinated because the benefit of not contracting the disease outweighs the risk. So let's see the figure one. The blue circle indicated those who have been vaccinated and white circle uh, indicate those who have not vaccinated. And the star in the middle indicated the people who cannot be vaccinated due to illness or constitution. For example, the measles vaccination rate in Japan is about only 70% because in Japan, vaccination is not mandatory but the right for the children. So, so some of the parents doesn't want to make the vaccinate with the, their children. So in this figure, 17 out of 25 people have been vaccinated. You can count the blue dot. And seven have not been vaccinated. So this means that 17 
people are extremely likely to get measles and seven people are at risk of getting measles. As figure one clearly show, uh, those marked with the star are also in contact with people who are at risk of contracting measles. So in other words, if a person marked with a star had not been vaccinated, he or she could have contracted measles. Actually, this is not a good situation. So what should we do? So let's see the figure two. We can create a situation in which all people except those who marked with a, a star have been vaccinated. This way, people uh, marked with the star can avoid contracting the disease, even if they do not receive vaccination. By everybody taking a little bit of vaccine risk, we can protect ourselves and others from infectious disease. It's the same thing in the situation of COVID-19. So in Japan, the first dose and the second dose of COVID-19 vaccine, uh, there are almost 80% of the people get vaccinated. However, third and fourth dose, only 20% get the vaccinated. So that the, um, there are the risk to get the disease in this stage situation. So we should be cautious how it is going. In summary, uh, purpose of immunization is to avoid contracting the disease, the cell. And if you do get it, the symptom will be mild. So this is kind of the impact of a vaccine. So like a COVID-19, infectious disease is caused by the small bacteria or the virus. However, it is so related to the social aspect. So you can see, well, oh, sorry. So you can see, um, to reduce uh, the infectious disease. So there are a lot of uh, factors uh, related. And also this kind of the, uh, the water care by the government and um, it's so important to protect the people's daily life. In the COVID-19 situation, uh, we had a lot of uh, influence, not only the health, but also the industrial matter and economic uh, aspect and the social life and the family life. Etc. So it is a really important book. I would like to introduce the body economic. This is um, written by the David Strucker and Sonia Batsu. Both are from the Harvard Scholars. And in this book, uh, they show the 
uh, the, the budget deficit caused the bad health outcome, not only the health, but uh, the economic itself are uh, damaged. So this um, book show the data, they illustrate that austerity policy that reduced social protection policy during a recession, fuel depression, suicide, infectious disease, and medical failure causing irreversible health damage, costing people their life and continuing to worsen society in the long run. So uh, in this COVID situation, the government um, spent a, a certain amount of the budget, but it is so necessary, it create the recovery after the pandemic. It is predicted. And uh, this book uh, uses uh, the past historical data in Russia and Greek and Iceland. And they compare the economic policy, economic policy and the outcome of their health. And in conclusion, um, they found that the if social protection policy are managed correctly, they do not bankrupt the public finance, but rather boost the economy. In the area of healthcare, a dollar of public investment boosts the economy by three dollars. The same is true for the education sector in the Iceland example, where the effect is more than an invest. So austerity is not good for the health, but the social development and human development. So we need to think how to use the limited money, but um, to protect the human health and the education is more important for human uh, development. This might be the conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Nivako Hosoda. It was a wonderful lecture. And I'm sure that the participants coming from multiple backgrounds, basically coming from engineering background, medical science background, management background, social science background, natural science background, would have been delighted to understand the socio-cultural determinants of health. Because in a common parallels, we look at health issues only from the medical science perspectives or the biological science perspectives. But when we we'll explore the socio-cultural determinants of health, then something uh, very insightful we get to know. We come to a mindset that we start looking at the things spread all over us, the local environment, the kind of lifestyle that we are having, the kind of economic, socio-cultural, political discourses that we are witnessing. So you try to explore some of these socio-cultural determinants in a fantastic way. And then what is very important, what is coming out from the lecture that you have delivered today and whatever we discussed yesterday and what we will discuss in the forthcoming days, the disparities, basically the health inequalities and the health-related disparities are literally challenging for this world. We need to make the right intervention at this point of time. Otherwise, when we talked about the health for all target in the Alma Alta Declaration way back in 1978, that we cannot fulfill unless we try to address these various 
determinants, and we try to understand the multidimensionality of health. Of course, the psychological aspects, the mental health aspects are again very important. The gender related things are very important. And we need to address all these things. So the purpose of this Gyan course was basically to attract participations, participants from different dimensions. This is the open course model. Participants have joined from multiple backgrounds, and I'm sure that they have learned a lot today. So I would I'd like to thank with these brief remarks. And then uh, uh, Professor Miwako, you can take a short break for five minutes because today, we have another small inaugural program here at the host institution. So we will remain connected online, but yes, some of our local authorities, provide chancellor, sir, dean, sir, local coordinator, they all will come to this room and they will get connected online. So the participants will get an opportunity to hear them also. And of course, you are the keynote speaker there. So the participants will get an, another opportunity to hear from you. Right, ma'am. So I think you need a short break to prepare yourself for the next marathon. So uh, uh, I request you to take a break of five, six minutes. And then again, we will start the program. And uh, I think, I don't know how much time you may need. How much time you may need? Professor Miwako. Uh, how, so could you please repeat again? No, no, I'm saying that we are going to start the program here, the small inaugural program, and you will be a keynote speaker in this program as we have already scheduled. You may need to speak uh, 10 to 12 minutes about this program, about this. So will you remain connected for the entire program or you need a break of five or 10 minutes? This oh. is what if you have five minutes break, it will be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is fine, ma'am. Basically, you take your 10 minutes, right? We will start the program and you will join it, right? The, the, the link will continue to be there. The participants will remain connected and we'll start the program. And then we will introduce you to the audience here again. And then uh, you will give the keynote address, but you will get an opportunity to listen to our local authorities over here, right? So take your five to 10 minutes and then join again. Okay, ma'am? Sounds great. Thank you very much. Okay, ma'am. Okay, okay. Now I address the participants. Basically, uh, we are going to have this inaugural program in five minutes' time, right? So that the participants, if they want to take some water or a cup of tea, they can take, but don't get disconnected, remain connected. We are going to start it shortly. And we have shifted the tutorial today half an hour because we need this recording time also as i've mentioned in the morning session also right so we will start the tutorial at 1 pm but this program will continue up to 12 45 right so remain connected thank you
I welcome. I welcome Pro Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University, Professor Gulwez Sahab, on this inaugural program. Please take your seat, sir. I welcome Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Mirza Asmar Beg Sahab. Please take your seat, sir. I welcome Local Coordinator of Gyan Program, Professor M. J. Varsi Sahab. Sir, please come. I welcome Chairperson of Department of Sociology, Professor Srini Sadiq, ma'am. Ma'am, please come. Take that seat, ma'am. I welcome course co-coordinator of this Gyan program, Dr. M. Swalehin Sahab. Please take your seat. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all these eminent guests and the faculty members and some of the students to this inaugural program of one week Gyan online program. This is an online program and we all know about Gyan. Before formally starting this program, I request Dr. Idris Mustaba, Dr. Idris Mustaba Sahib for recitation from Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط العزيز العام تعليم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا صرف الله العلي العظيم. This Gyan program on social capital and health in India is basically an effort to look at the issues related to health from multiple dimensions and to explore the <coughs> socio-cultural determinants and variables related to health, healthcare. We all understand that health disparity and health inequality is one of the biggest problem world over. Way back in 1978, we talked about health for all during the Alma Atta Declaration and then in 2000, we had the Millennium Development Goals. And in 2015, we had the Sustainable Development Goals. All these goals and targets talk about health issues, healthcare issues. But to what extent the socio-cultural determinants, the policy matters, the political economy, the governance, 
all these things affect the health related requirements of people this is actually under explored the social capital social capital is a wonderful concept in our day to day life we always talk about social networks trust kind of thing in sociology there is a wonderful concept of social capital and cultural capital along with the well known concept of economic capital we all know about economic capital or capital as such but we seldom talk about the social capital aspects and the cultural capital aspects so this is an effort to address the things we are having six days scheduled lectures the topics that we are going to cover are related to health expenditure system of medicine then the health practices prevailing in the western world our foreign faculty for this program is professor miwako hosoda from saisa university japan she has achieved wonderful things her papers are published in lancet she has completed her degrees from uh, premier universities of the west so before going for the other specific requirements of this program for, formal program i request professor shiri shadik ma'am chairperson department of sociology to say a formal welcome to all our guests present here professor shiri shadik ma'am honorable guests esteemed participants colleagues and dear students assalam alaikum and good afternoon to all of you it gives me great great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural function of this one week online course on social capital and health in india organized by the department of sociology aligarh muslim university with support from global initiative of academic networks gyan ministry of education government of india i would like to take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to a chief guest professor mohammad gulrez sahab pro vice chancellor aligarh muslim university our guests of honor professor mirza asmar beg sahab dean faculty of social sciences and foreign faculty professor miwako hosoda siza university japan professor hosoda is a vice president of siza university and has been doing her sociological research through observing human relations in the healthcare and education field i would also like to welcome the gyan coordinator aligarh muslim university professor m j varsi department of linguistics aligarh muslim university i am happy to announce that more than 100 participants are enrolled in this program from all over the country i am extremely thankful to them for their trust which is commendable and is definitely inspiring and motivating global initiative of academic network in higher education is a promising scheme of the government of india through the ministry of human resource development the scheme connects india's top institutions and central universities with global faculty keeping the importance of this scheme aligarh muslim university has taken a keen interest in hosting the gyan program it is a matter of pride that my colleagues professor mohammad akram and dr mohammad salihin have made sincere efforts to link the department with this contemporary global scheme i am sure the course will be fruitful in providing gainful insights relating to the topic it aims to converse upon as well as building a stronger academic i now 
request the course coordinator, Professor Muhammad Akram, to present Momento to our chief guest, Professor Muhammad Gulre Sahab, Pro Vice Chancellor, as a I also request Professor Mohammad Akram to present the memento to our Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Mirza Asmar Beg Sahar. As a token of appreciation for the support extended, I request Professor Akram to present the memento to coordinator MJ Varsi Sahab. To appreciate the efforts put in by the course coordinator, I request our Pro Vice Chancellor Sahab to present the memento to Professor Mohammad Akram, course coordinator. The support extended by Dr. Swalihin is commendable. And I also request Professor Gulre Sahab to present the memento to Dr. Mohammad Swalihin. Thank you very much, Professor Shinish Adit, ma'am, Chairperson, Department of Sociology, for formally welcoming all, uh, all our guests. Now, I request our PVC Sahab, Professor Muhammad Gulwes Sahab, to present a memento to Chairperson Professor Shiri Shadi. Yes, yeah, Thank you very much. This is for honoring not proceed further. So it is the highest number that we have uh, received in the university. I in medicine, engineering, and technology. We have also in humanities and social sciences, we have received large number of grants for this. And uh, uh, we have been, um, then we had in economics, we have in linguistics, English, Hindi, and political science history. So we have covered almost all humanities and social sciences departments. So this is very prestigious. The idea behind this was then it was in 2014 to England, to UK, to Canada, to Fiji, to like uh, Japan, to many other continents, the people have part of the university that uh, uh, in global perspective that when we look at internationally. So these programs, these events are uh, very important. It looks very short, like, but it, in perspective and viability, these are very big programs. And we exchange our ideas, we exchange our knowledge, we exchange our research, we exchange our, like going to have mutual 
collaborations with foreign faculty. This is also one of the mandate of the GAN, that during the GAN program, we can have a meeting with the foreign faculty for future collaborations. So if we are for looking for the exchange programs where our students can abroad and take advantage of their cutting edge technology and research. So these are very, very important programs. So Aligarh Muslim University has taken keen interest and I must confess and thankful to the vice chancellor sir who has given me the freedom to work. Like young people sometimes get annoyed with me with getting so many emails from me. But that is things that we have to do to get the maximum projects approved. And finally, like uh, I would also like to request March is coming, there's the closing of the financial year. So in next financial year, it is going to, they are going to open the window. So I urge, I request all the faculty members uh, in the last phase in 2018 or 19, we have reached every single faculty members of the university. So this year also I will, I'm trying, I will be going to you, every one of you with the information to open when the window is going to open for the GAN proposal. So we request you to submit as much as possible. The maximum cap for our university is 50 maximum proposals we can submit. In the last phase, we have submitted 47 at least. Like So this is uh, this is kind of hard work, but we have to do it to get the maximum approval from the ministry. And this is also very, as I said, prestigious. I must congratulate the Department of Sociology, the chairperson of the department, in particular, Professor Muhammad Akram, who is very hardworking. He kept calling me like from time to time and uh, even during the odd hours, but we have worked together. We get this approved and we are here to have looking at it practically happening. I must uh, also like to thank Professor Mohammed Gulesh, sir, the Pro Vice Chancellor uh, of Aligarh University for all the support and all the dignitaries, all the administrative people, I would like to thank, pay thank as a local coordinator of the GAN. I would like, since this is the inaugural, as a formal welcome from my side on behalf of the university and on my personal behalf, I would like to welcome all the participants, those who have joined in large number, as I mentioned, someone mentioned that is more than 100 participants is a big success uh, of any program when we have this large number of participants on this. So I welcome you all. Uh, online and offline, those, those who have joined from different parts of the globe. So as a coordinator, I welcome you all. And I am sure these five days, this one week long program, and during the program when we have discussions, question and answer sessions, all the argument that we are going to have to enrich the understanding of the subject matter. And so I'm sure we all will get enriched from the outcome of this workshop. So with this few words, once again, I welcome you all. And thanks to the Department of Sociology and Professor Muhammad Agram for successfully organizing this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor M.J. Varsi Sahab for presenting the achievements of Aligarh Muslim University in the context of Gyan program. Yes, this is commendable job that our university has conducted so many Gyan programs. And the purpose of having this inaugural program, this small inaugural program is this, that we should get motivated from each other, that we, the one department is doing these activities and the other departments can also initiate. And I, I would like to share one more thing here. Basically, this experience is fantastic. We are getting participants connected from Jammu Kashmir to Tamil Nadu, Kerala, West Bengal, Bihar, UP, almost every state we are having participants. So they are bringing with them lots of experiences and local concerns. So these things basically make this global, global initiative wonderful. The foreign faculty from Japan, Miwako Hosada, and we all know that Japan is one of the best states in terms of the health achievements. So we have been listening a lot from Miwako Hosada. Now it's time to request a guest of honor for this program and keynote speaker, Professor Miwako Hosada, who is connected from Japan to address this gathering. Professor Miwako Hosada, guest of honor and key speaker and foreign faculty for this program. Yes, ma'am, please address to this gathering. We are all connected online. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, so, Namaskar. Uh, it is a great honor to have uh, this opportunity at the Department of Sociology 
Algar Muslim University. I truly appreciate all distinguished faculty members and Professor Mohammed Akram for arranging this wonderful, remarkable online course. In this course, I will be lecturing from the sociological perspective on social capital and social determinant of health as related to health. Through this course, I hope to learn from you and from others about social capital and the wisdom and practice of protecting health in India. In this course, I'd like to learn about social capital and health. By the way, are you healthy? According to the World Health Organization, WHO, health is defined as a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not simply the absence of disease. Physical health, mental health, not simply the absence of disease. Physical health uh, is related and all are uh, related with social life and have a lot of influence to health. A nutritionally balanced diet, good sleep, and moderate exercise are very important for health. But at the same time, not being poor, not being unemployed, and having a good relationship with others are also very much related to health. The connection of all social activities to people's health is referred to the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So sociology can play an important role to promote health. We are living in an age of anthropocene a time of dramatic expansion of human activity and rapid socioeconomic and environmental change. The pandemic of COVID-19 in this context raised many issues for us. The COVID-19 caused uh, various adverse effects, such as serious health hazard, and in some cases, can it lead to death? In some cases, COVID-19 patients do not have access to treatment opportunity due to shortage of medical professionals and healthcare facilities. Not only physical damage, but also COVID-19 caused social problems, including panic buying the paper materials such as face mask and toilet papers. Discrimination and stigma against COVID-19 patients and their family members, and depression of people and economic harm is also occurred. These were occurred by a various of reasons, including a lack of political leadership problems with the way that medical provides information and the medical crops. Thus, a social component is needed to protect human rights and health. However, there is another important factor to protecting people's health. That is the natural environment. Clean water, clean air, rich soil, and the good global environment are closely related to people's health. This is illustrated by the concept of planetary health. Planetary health has been expanding globally since 1915. Rockefeller Foundation at the Lancet launched the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. In 2015, many global challenges can be better understand by engaging the concept of planetary health. It provides the critical linkage and causal relationship between human health and environmental change. 
Planetary Health emphasized that the urgent task is to view the relationship among people, society, and nature, and to seek new way to connecting them. What kind of relationship between people, society, and uh, nature is appropriate for sustainable society that are resilient against disease and disaster and that can enjoy the benefit of nature? For sustainable uh, development goals to achieve, the, it is called SDGs of the United Nations, need to promote social transformation with common goal at the local and national level and globally. One way to do this is to refer to good practice in different regions. If we look at the health of the Japanese people in terms of life expectancy, men to be 81 years old and women to be 87 years old. It is almost the country with the longest life expectancy in the world. The long life expectancy does not mean that Japanese medical care and public health are excellent. And various programs have been pointed out, actually. The Great East Japan earthquake and nuclear power plant accident that occurred in 2011 still left many people with great damage. There are also the problem of COVID-19, a global pandemic that the better and overcome the pandemic and uh, the social um, in the way of thinking and health from social aspect and social system. Also, I will expand planetary health by providing some examples of living with illness or disabilities and coexist of nature and human. It shows community willing, arising from the reflection of the nuclear power plant accident caused by the Great East Japan earthquake. This will help us to think about how the healthier and well-being based on the symbiosis between people and nature and the community ties in possible. Uh, it look for, I'm very looking forward to discussing these matters with you. I'd like to conclude my remarks by praying that the friendship between Japan and India will continue as before and that our academic exchange will be even more active. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Professor Mimako Hosodana, for your precious uh, keynote address. <laughs> the Global Initiative Program is truly global. We are connected uh, from India and we are basically listening people from Japan. So the ICT thing have basically brought wonderful things. However, there are local level issues related to connectivity. And that is why I thought that the keynote speaker should address first. Now it is a turn of uh, our guest of honor, Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Mirza Asmar Beg Sahab. Sir, I welcome you. And we all are eager to listen from you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pro Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's really very, it's a very happy moment for all of us that our faculty is uh, organizing another GAN program because we recently had a GAN program in the Department of Economics in our faculty. So, Again, we are having this program and I hope that faculty, especially the students are benefiting from this program. And the subject was very interesting for me because in today's world, you know, in today's globalized world, which is 
heavily influenced by the ideology of neoliberalism. In this age, health is a very important issue because health is only available to people who can afford to pay for it. So we live in a, in a situation or in, in times where we need to think about social capital, which is something positive, which comes out as a result of our interactions. And it brings in tangible, non-tangible consequences also, and thereby we, de we develop networks in the society. And that is something which, is, which could be a counterpoint to the dominant you know, trends in the society as far as health is concerned. So I expect, I am rather sure that this uh, workshop would address this aspect, which is the most important aspect to my mind, because given the poverty levels in our country, given the uh, standing of India and the global uh, hunger index, uh, human development index, or whatever index is there, you know, which measures poverty and backwardness in any society. So I hope uh, these issues would be rather on the a top agenda of discussions, which would be rather coming in the next week because we started yesterday. And I hope that the interactions uh, with the faculty in the course of the next week would be very productive for the students who take part in this uh, program. Uh, I take your leave because this is the time where you are not rather very willing to listen to long speeches. So we would listen from the pro vice chancellor who talk on the subject. I take your leave, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mirza Asmar Beg Sahab. Now, I would like to invite the Pro Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University, Professor Mohammad Gulre Sahab, to address the participants and the gathering. Thank you, sir. Chairperson Roshirin Sadiq. Coordinator of the program, Professor Muhammad Akram, Foreign Faculty Coordinator, Gyan Program, and Varsity Distinguished Faculty Members and the students. Taking in Africa with the UN program, say 20 years back, I was discussing with the you know the neighbors and uh, the African natives as to what they understand about social capital, because you know, these are the terminologies which got currency in India of late, but you know, in West and as well as in Africa, you know, there's lots of use of these currencies. They say we do not have much capital to invest in bank because we do not have money. What we invest is in our neighborhood. And this is what we call social capital because we depend on each other's help and support for our living, for our survival. So this is the basic meaning of you know, social capital, that how with the you know, trust and confidence on our neighborhood, on our society, we can build a society and through which we can achieve what may be achievable at one point of time in respective time and scale. This is largely a sociological concept started way back in 19th century. I think Durkheim's references are there that, you know, that uh, in case there is a trust in the society, there will be minimized, uh, the societal cases would be there, then you know, social consciousness of Karl Marx, we also get references of these. But there are issues also, you know, when we discuss about the you know, trust and confidence and about the ability of society vis-a-vis -vis of civil society, you know, that there is no quantum how to measure it. You know. When we say that civil society and health, civil society and environment, social capital and environment, we do not have exact measurement as to, to what extent. You know. It is really beneficial because you know when people are meeting and achieving something, it also becomes incumbent upon us that as a sociologist, as a political scientist, social worker, that we have to find out as to what is the measure of you know, achieving that the results are forthcoming. I think this is a challenge before all us social scientists and you know, the especially sociologists while attempting to these things, they should understand this. 
there's an old saying again i'm going back to africa ibantu you know it says that i am because we are so this is a a collective being in i was also reading somewhere re relating to health issues that the invocation of religious sentiments is the bringing society together during the covid period the the prime minister's narration and you know the narration that in 21 days we will won the war of covid and because we could win the war of mahabharata in 18 days so 21 days 3 weeks lockdown we will win the war i think this is the kind of a social trust you know we used to laugh at times that you know what is these things have to do with you know during the time of covid but it matters it gives a confidence to people around in the communities that look here there is a government because there should be a close connection between civil society and government there is the trust in the institutions so in case the the prime minister is telling that 21 days are enough because 18 days mahabharat is there or you know for that matter social trust that you know among the people among the neighborhood that you know you make a social distancing and wear mask and the, the, there there is somebody who has to look after and who will take care of us i think these things matter in the country where around 47000 you know people are dependent on one doctor and and that to talk about a problem one doctor i think unless and until we put our hands together and we work for the betterment of the community i think there is no other alternative i would request request all of you that the, the book i read long back uh, democracy work by robert putnam making democracy work by robert putnam i think all of the sociologists all sociologists must read it and this book is is, is a kind of a bible on social capital which says that you know how in italy we have seen that the, the changes have brought about by devolving the power from central to local agencies the, the the kind of you know we have our local bodies you know devolving the power and finances also it matters you know that the, the democracy from the bottom up bottom up not from top down approach i think these are the mantras which we have to follow and uh, i congratulate uh, the organizers and the department uh, for, for connecting uh, students and the scholars on such a very important topic and i also congratulate the coordinator gyan for bringing such an important discussion to the campus and i hope that the discussion will go a long way in further building up this theory and you know working on those established norms thank you very much thank you very much professor mohammad gulrey sahab pro vice chancellor aligarh muslim university sir you brought wonderful ideas to the das your primary experiences from some of the countries that you have already visited and then your insights from our own country these these things have beautified the discourses the discussion certainly all the participants have got benefited and personally i am very thankful because this has broadened the horizon on which we have been working so sir all the participants and basically all the keynote speakers have brought new ideas professor mirza asmar bag mirza asmar bag who is coming from political science background he brought a new context to the situation and professor mohammad gulrez sahab basically he is associated with a west asia department and he is having vast uh, academic experiences he brought further new empirical experiences so i'm thankful to all the eminent guests of today's program now because of keeping in mind the 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 the, the, the tenure that the specific time allocated for this program i request dr mohammad swalehin sahab co coordinator of this gyan program to present a vote of thanks i feel honored to propose vote of thanks in this one week online course on social capital and health from 13 to 19 february 2023 under google initiatives of our academy professor and co coordinator of this program 
At the onset, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University, Tariq Manfur Sahab, for the support and encouragement of this online course program. I would also like to extend the gratitude to the Chief Guest of the program, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Muhammad Gulbe Sahab, to grace the occasion. On behalf of the department, I am thankful to you, sir, for sparing your valuable time to this online program. I would like to thank to the guest of honor of the program, Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Asmar Baik Sahab. Sir, your banning presence of the program stimulates us for further academic engagements in future. I am thankful to the distinguished academician and guest of honor, foreign faculty of this Gyan program, Professor Mevako Hoseta from CSI University, Japan, for her engaging association with the Legal Muslim University through online Gyan program. Ma'am, we are heartily thankful to you for this academic engagement. I am also thankful to Professor M.J. Warsi Sahab, the local coordinator of Gyan program of Aligarh Muslim University. Sir, we are thankful to you for your enduring support and supervision all through to make this online program practically possible. Further, I would like to extend my gratitude, gratitude to the chairperson of the Department of Sociology, Professor Shirin Sahadik, ma'am, for her kind support and cooperation. Ma'am, you have given all due logistic support and cooperation to make this program successful. I'm thankful to you, ma'am. I am deeply and hearty thankful to the host faculty and course coordinator of this online program, Professor Muhammad Abram Sahar. I am very thankful to you for organizing and coordinating this academic Gyan program on social capital and health in India. Certainly, this program is going to instigate and stimulate young researchers and students to explore the significance of relationship between social capital and health in India. I am thankful to the faculty members of the Department of Sociology for their active participation and support to the program. I am also thankful to the faculty members of different departments of the, uh, from different departments for gracing the occasion. Your valuable presence motivates us for further academic engagements in time to come. At last but not the least, I am thankful to the students and research scholars for their presence in the program. Hearty congratulations to the online participation participants of the program for the in, for their keen interest in the participation in this one week Gyan online course. And I'm also thankful to the IIT Kharagpur as a, a nodal institution for coordinating and making this program possible. So we are to Ministry of Education also is really uh, uh, important to mention over here in this program. With you all support from the different institutions, we literally are being able to make this program more practically possible. And thank you from the everyone present over here. Thank you very much. Thank you. very much Dr. sociology this entire program is basically uh, logistically supported by ministry of education government of india and iit kharagpur is the nodal agency of this program iit kharagpur is doing wonderful job in coordinating all these program which are spread all over the all over india all the premier institutions are basically making the collaboration in this program this is a wonderful initiative of government of india basically that is a visionary approach in the national education policy we have been looking at new provisions and this gyan based open courses are giving new dimension to the system of education in India. In, I would like to ex share here one experience, one of the institution from Tamil Nadu, there are many participants from that institution and the students communicated to me that in my specific provision how is a part of the formal system of the education over there. So this is the future when we are talking about the open elective programs. As of now, we are keeping the open electives confined to the department or the faculty level or the university level. But in the forthcoming years, we will get this opportunity to have open electives from all over the country. And very sure that in the forthcoming time, we'll get an opportunity to learn from the foreign universities also. So this is how the trajectory of Gyan will continue to be there. Thank you very much, all the institutions, government of India, IIT Kharagpur, and our certainly our 
institution Aligarh Muslim University for provi providing the platform. So with these uh, short remarks, I would like to say the online participants that here we will close the discussion for today's lecture and we will meet after 10 minutes for the tutorial classes as scheduled. We need uh, 15 minutes time for basically recording the things because we have to upload these videos to Gyan also. I would like to thank Professor Mivako Hosada who started her lectures at 10 a.m. and she is continuously engaged and again she's having one hour tutorial. So thank you ma'am for your stamina and your presence. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, please close that program.